and we are recording. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me for this HSN Alumni Speaker Series event on management consulting. I have with me, as with every week, a very esteemed speaker, Talha Yusuf from the HSN College, Badge of 2014. Talha is a former consultant at the Boston Consulting Group, uh, or BCG, in Chicago. Uh, currently, he is a strategy and operations manager at Mirror, and he also happens to be a University of Chicago alum. Uh, deeply appreciate you joining, Talha. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for organizing and happy to join. Thank you. So this event has been uh, sponsored by AMG, which is the Aitzen Mentorship Group. We're a group of over 360 old boys connected over WhatsApp, Facebook, and Discord. We host uh, events like these to educate Aitzonians and old boys about entrepreneurship, financial literacy, and potential career paths. To participate in any of these initiatives, you can always email me uh, on this email address given below. Now an outline for today's event. First up, we'll have a discussion with our speaker, Tala Yusuf. This will be followed by a brief 20-minute uh, Q&A session with the audience. And lastly, if we have any time remaining after the questions, uh, we can do some networking and you know just stop recording the session. So I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, move on to my first question, which is, uh, Talha, you started your work at BCG as an associate. So what was day-to-day -day work like? So was it very busy? Like, uh, what were the hours like? And please tell us, like, uh, in depth, uh, what you did in that role. Yep, absolutely. So uh, generally, at places like BCG and consulting firms, your day to day varies a lot based on what project you're on. Uh, and, you know, these consulting firms like do a little bit of everything. So like, it could be really anything. There were days where I would start at, you know, like 830 in the morning, we typically do like team check ins uh, to discuss the priorities for the day. And then if it's a very analysis heavy case, what I would do is, you know, like be pretty uh, deep into an Excel model, trying to build, you know, like a forecast or something of that effect, and then doing a few interviews throughout the day with experts in, you know, whatever industry it is that I'm working in to test assumptions to, you know, like get a better sense of like, what are the drivers of whatever model I'm building? And then uh, typically, you know, like in the afternoon and the like, I'd be socializing that with my manager first, and then also doing like a case study meeting with partners, uh, you know, like after that, to get everyone's input. And then spend the rest of the evening like continuing to refine the model, uh, building slides from that, and then you know like the day after maybe presenting to clients. So that would be like a very analysis heavy case. If you're on something more qualitative, like you know maybe doing uh, research on a new market, right, which still like has a quantitative bend to it, but it's mostly qualitative. Like that, you know, would more likely involve meetings with the client, uh, you know, just to get their hypotheses, and then from there going in again, interviewing a bunch of experts, uh, you know, working on slides and trying to package whatever findings you're getting and then uh, meeting again with your team uh, as a group to try to review that and then again sharing with the client. So I would say consulting, especially at the associate and consultant level, so undergrad and post MBA, tends to involve a lot of analysis. So you spend a lot of time in Excel. Uh, it's a lot of PowerPoint. That's really the bread and butter for consultants. So you spend a lot of time in that. There's like additional tools that we started using, such as Alteryx, which is a data cleaning tool, and then uh, Tableau, which is a very effective data visualization tool. So you can ex expect to spend some time in that as well. Uh, but those are like the different platforms and tools. And uh, you know, in terms of like what types of people you're meeting, uh, Typically, you interact with uh, you know pretty senior clients. Uh, the sponsor for a project at a BCG might be a CFO or a CEO. So, as an associate or a consultant, you're not necessarily meeting them that frequently. But you know the people right below them, so they typically like have a team that works with you pretty day to day. You're going to be interacting with them a lot, so that's like one pretty heavy interaction point. Uh, you know, you're obviously working with the partners on the team who are very senior themselves. And then uh, depending on the project, you're also doing a bunch of expert interviews, which uh, I found to be a very cool way to quickly find out, you know, a bunch of stuff about a different, you know, industry, because at the end of the day, like in a, as an associate or a consultant, you're not an expert, right? Uh, you're being hired because you have a certain way of doing analysis and a very quick and efficient way of getting to insights. 
Uh, and the way we do that is by leveraging experts both internally at BCG and then externally through a bunch of expert networks. So all in all, that's like what the work looks like. To answer the second part of your question in terms of uh, you know, what the hours are like, uh, the hours can be a little brutal. So you know, typically I would say that people start their day around eight, uh, you know, 8.39 is when like the team will check in for 30 minutes to discuss priorities. And then uh, you're probably gonna be working until like six or seven at the office if it's like a fully in-person case or you know, at the client site. After which, like people will do like a checkout, and then you will go back to the hotel or home if you're, you know, in your home city, and then continue working from there after you're know, taking maybe a dinner break for an hour. So my hours would typically average from like eight to ten, uh, eight in the morning, ten at night, with like you know maybe an hour off for dinner around seven. Uh, now there's good projects where I would work from eight to six, and there were bad projects where I would work from eight to two in the morning. Uh, and I think that is one of the drivers for why a lot of people don't stay in the job for very long, uh, just because like it isn't you know the most sustainable job. That being said, uh, comparing it to something like investment banking, which is also a very popular uh, career option among Hedgesonians, and then also you know like generally in college and business school, uh, like it is better than that. Uh, from a sustainability standpoint. Thank you so much for that, Tala. I think that covers everything. I think all you know, the questions I asked, really appreciate it. Yeah, um, but also, are there like a multitude of other roles, like apart from consultants? Because I recently spoke with a few people, they were like capabilities, insight analysts, and you know, could you please shed some light on like mm -hmm. what those roles are like? Yep, yeah, absolutely. So the way I think about, uh, you know, a BCG and how it's structured, and you know, it's pretty similar with McKinsey and Bain as well, you have the core consulting team that's, you know, like the traditional consulting work that uh, these firms have historically been doing. Uh, historically, it would skew very heavily towards strategy and very little towards implementation. But over time, BCG, McKinsey, and Bain have built a lot of their capabilities towards executing products as well, because clients are a lot more sophisticated today than they used to be like 20 years ago. And they typically don't just want like, you know, pie in the sky strategies. They're like, okay, like you need to help us actually implement this. So that implementation work can be done by the traditional consulting team as well, but we've also started building specialist teams. I think at BCG, we call the Platinian, who are more specifically geared towards implementation work. So they're like working on that. That's like one career path. Uh, we also have something called digital ventures, and I'm sure McKinsey and Bain have like their equivalent for that too. So those are also consultants, but specialists in more of like the digital work, right? So a lot of companies, especially like large Fortune 500 are thinking about, you know, building their own digital capabilities, uh, decreasing their reliance on, you know, like more traditional products. Uh, BCG uh, DB team is like the type of team that will help do that. So that's like still consulting work, but slightly different. Then outside of, you know, this uh, consulting track, you have another thing that's called the expert track. So you're still like a consultant, but instead of like going for partner or like, you know, being on like the ladder to partner, you can uh, make the choice to instead specialize in like a very specific topic area, and then you become an expert matter uh, or subject matter expert, you know, for that particular niche or industry or topic and stay within BCG. So that's another track. Those are all the consulting tracks. Now there's like a bunch of people that, you know, basically empower the consultants to be as effective as they are. Uh, so at BCG, those teams are called uh, the biggest one is the knowledge team, so KT for short. Uh, that's, you know, like similar to the expert consultants, but like they are typically not client facing. So think of them as serving the BCG consultants. So their clients are like people like me, right? Like I might be starting a new project and like, let's say renewables, and I know nothing about renewables. One of the first things that I'm going to do is uh, hit the KT list host to like get a sense of like BCG's best thinking on the topic and like any previous projects that we might have worked on, which had a similar scope or, you know, had findings that we could leverage. Uh, so that's one team. Then we have another team that's called DRS. I frankly don't know what that stands for, but they're more of the okay, instead of me spending time doing desk research on Google to figure out, you know, like uh, something about a market, I can get people to do that for me. Uh, so typically those tend to be employees in more offshore areas. So, you know, for the US, I think we leverage like a bunch of people in South America and then also an India team that works like US hours. Uh, so they're really helpful because you can just tell them that, you know, this is a specific research that I want done. Uh, you know, this is the amount of time I would spend on it. Can you like do this for me? 
Uh, so that's another team. And then, you know, like your typical HR functions like finance, uh, HR, talent acquisition, uh, IT, and the like. I, I'd say that, you know, like all of those are pretty important to the BCG job as well. But uh, there's going to be a lot of people employed by BCG. I'm forgetting what the exact stati statistic is, but I think for like every one consultant, they have like two or three like business function employees as well to kind of, you know, allow them to be as efficient as they are. Right. Thank you. So there are like so many, there's a plethora of opportunities, not just in, in the consulting track, but in support for consultants. So really appreciate Absolutely. that. Uh, so what was the recruiting process like for you? When did you start? What was your timeline like? And how did you practice for cases? Did you have like a group of friends or a consultant club? Uh, would appreciate an answer on that. Yep, absolutely. So I happened to get lucky where I joined a consulting club uh, in college, I want to say my sophomore year, uh, which, you know, it, it was not like a, we're going to prepare you for consulting as a career club, but it was more so student run consulting. Uh, so they used to do like consulting projects for a bunch of clients, typically nonprofits, because we're not asking them to pay us anything. Uh, and that was my first introduction to the world of consulting, because before that, like, I didn't know what BCG, McKinsey, Bain were, you know, and I didn't know what management consulting as an industry was. So that was my first exposure to the space. And then uh, a bunch of people in that club were also considering management consulting as a potential career path. So I think I got a natural uh, built in group of friends that I could practice with when the time came, which was really helpful. And then the other really helpful thing was that this club had a ton of alums at like all the consulting firms. So as an example, one of my mentors from that club who was a senior when I was a sophomore and she recruited me to the club was then going to be working at BCG the year after. Similarly, another mentor was working in McKinsey. So I think like having those connections, uh, you know, where it wasn't just me like randomly getting someone up on LinkedIn or reaching out to someone, you know, in a cold way, like where I had like these actual connections, people that I knew really helped, not necessarily in terms of me getting an offer, but more so in terms of preparing me for the interview process and even like getting the interview, which is difficult, but, you know, doable as long as you have one or two people at a particular firm that can vouch for you. And, you know, obviously you have like a strong profile in the like, which I would say is like table stakes, like you need that if, without that, you know, you're not going to get an interview. So I would say in terms of like how to get an interview and then how to get an offer, uh, you know, first things first, like I said, you need a very strong profile that's table stakes. Like without that, you know, you can know whoever you want to know at the consulting firm, it's not going to work. Uh, and the way I think about your profile or your resume, right, there's like three components to it. The first component is academics. Uh, so typically these firms tend to recruit from uh, what they describe as target schools, right? So like if you're at a U Chicago or a Columbia or like, you know, an Ivy League university, like those tend to be target schools. So like they have a natural pipeline to these firms. Uh, what that means is that there's going to be institutionalized recruiting happening at these schools. So like it's a little easier to get exposure to like, when's recruiting going to happen? When am I going to get interviews? Like, you know, all of that. And then obviously you have a ton of alums working from that school at these you know, companies, which definitely helps, right? Because they're going to be the ones who are going to be doing the first pass of the resume reviews. Uh, but I will say at, when I was at BCG, uh, we're starting to move a, a little bit away from that model and also uh, casting a wider net. So going to more schools, even if they're not like, you know, traditional target schools, which I think is a good thing because I frankly think BCG and McKinsey miss out on a lot of talent by just focusing on 10 or 15 schools. But Hopefully that's going to continue to change. So that's like the first thing. And then, you know, like what your GPA is, what your SAT score was, which is actually like funny for me because I thought, you know, once I take the SAT in high school, like I'm never going to need to think about it again. But even when you apply for a business school, for example, they might ask what your SAT is. And like definitely when you apply for a consulting job, even after college, they will ask what your SAT is because it's a very quick proxy for just your intellectual aptitude, which... Uh, you know, you can make the argument about how important that truly is, but, you know, the truth is that consulting firms definitely, like, uh, rate that pretty heavily. So you want a GPA, ideally, of above 3.7, and then you want an SAT score that's, like, above, like, 2,200 if you're doing, like, the old scoring, and then I think, like, from the new scoring, like, somewhere above, like, 1,450, I think, is ideal. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you need that. Uh, like, I definitely know people with a lower GPA or lower SAT score who were able to make the cut, but you're facing an uphill battle if, uh, you know, you don't need those baseline stats. So that's the first section of the resume. The second then is what your work experience is like. Obviously, 
you want to be able to communicate through your resume that you can handle the job. Uh, and consulting is one of those unique jobs where there's just a bunch of different skills that you're going to need to build as well as leverage. So really, you can spin any past experience into a beneficial stepping stone towards consulting. But you need to like have that thread basically tying all those experiences together so that you know if I'm reading your resume, I can kind of see why you're considering consulting and how you would be a good fit. So the quality of your work experience matters, but then also the specific brands you're working at can matter, right? So if you have an internship at like, let's say JP Morgan, uh, and I am sitting in McKinsey reviewing your resume, that's instantly gonna give me a signal that, okay, JP Morgan, which is a very reputable organization, considered me good enough to give me an offer, right? So it's like this like cycle of affirmation which starts, which is why typically, uh, the more big brands you have in your resume in terms of past internships or work experience, the, the better it is. But that being said, you know, like that's not the only way to get an interview, right? You might have some really cool experience working at a startup that no one knows about, but like you maybe led like the launch of a new product in a new market, right? So like th that's like stuff which you're not going to get to do at a JP Morgan, which is why I would say it's like, it, it's it's a trade-off like you know either you get like really high quality experience at like a place that's maybe not as well known or you you know like go to the traditional brands and then get like the stamp of approval essentially and both are fine but you know like that, that's kind of how you should be thinking about it and then the third part of your application is you know the cover letter which a lot of people think doesn't matter at all uh but it matters in the sense of like uh, they're going to run that through like a software to see like, are you addressing this to BCG or are you addressing this to McKinsey, right? Because like, if like you're not putting in the effort to uh, foolproof your letter and you accidentally like use the same letter for all three of the companies, right? Like that's a bad sign from a role that's going to be very client facing, right? Because you're going to need to spell check your work a lot. You're going to need to foolproof your work. You're going to need to do like all the QC work you need to do on it. So that's like one thing. And then the second part of the cover letter that's important is that's your opportunity to mention, you know, one or two people at BCG that you would consider either mentors or connections. Uh, so, you know, like those names can make a difference, right? So when I was on the recruiting team, I would just literally hit control F on like the hundred cover letters I would get from New Chicago and, you know, like search for my name, search for like names of my colleagues and like, you know, immediately like that way, if like someone had talked to me, but I'd forgotten about them and like I read their cover letter and they'd mentioned me, like it would instantly ring the bell and be like, yeah, like I talked to this person uh, and, you know, I think they, they should get an interview. So that, that's kind of how I would think about the interview. Uh, and also like, feel free to stop me and ask questions because then I've been blabbering for uh, the past 10 minutes now. Oh, this has been really uh, helpful. And I think you're covering uh, so many questions, which many people usually have. You know yeah. about uh, casing and you know the preparation for it and like what factors are involved but yeah. uh, also i uh, wanted to ask specifically about any books which were helpful for you when you were preparing and if you would uh, recommend any other resources like maybe having a good linkedin profile does that really help yeah i would say something like a linkedin profile can definitely hurt you but i don't think it's going to help you if that makes sense right like if you have a very bare bone LinkedIn profile where like I can't really dig up any detail on you then like maybe that set sends like the wrong message so I think it's good to just have like an updated LinkedIn but like I wouldn't spend too much time trying to like make it perfect because like that's not what's going to get you an offer right yeah. uh, so I think like that's that in terms of books I think a lot of people over index on these like they're not actually that important uh, the point of a consulting book, at least, you know, in the beginning should be to give you a sense of how to think about the case, what the case format is like, and what are, you know, typical strategies. So I know that, you know, like, there, there's like a couple of books that are really famous, there's Case in Point, and then I think like there's Case in Two Secrets by Victor Cheng. Those tend to be the two like more popular ones. And, you know, you could read any of them and like, that's fine. I went with another book called Embrace the Case, which I liked because it relied less on frameworks, which is, you know, like pretty heavy for the other books and more so on a way of thinking, because I think that that's more helpful for consulting interviews, right? If you're relying on frameworks and then you get a case that like doesn't allow you to use one of those frameworks, you're kind of screwed, right? Whereas if you instead think about the traditional progression of a case and then uh, instead of like relying on, okay, if it's going to be a pricing case, I'm going to do this. If it's going to be a profitability case, I'm going to do this. Uh, you just generally like have a sense of how to analytically break down whatever problem it is and think about what are going to be the key drivers of, you know, like solving that particular problem. 
I, I think that's the better approach, which is why I read that book. And with these books, what I would say is like, read them, skim them, you know, but then like, don't keep going back to them. It's like you read it once and then you're done. The most important part after that is actually practicing with people. Uh, and the way that I would practice in order to be efficient is first practice with, uh, you know, friends who are either going through this process with you, right? Because like they will have a better sense of like what to look for and what to coach you on than like a complete random stranger who has no idea about consulting. But at the same time, they're not like actual consultants. So this is going to be a non-evaluated way for you to, you know, get a sense of how cases work and start building those skills before you actually like take it to the next level. So that's like what I would say level one. Level two is if you're in college or, you know, if even after college or, you know, business school or whatever, uh, after you've prepped a few times with some friends and have a general sense of how a case works, it's good to get a practice case done with someone who either interned at BCG or McKinsey or Bain or got an offer from them uh, because clearly they were good enough to get the offer, which means that they can give you more targeted feedback on what you're doing well, what maybe you need to improve. Uh, and again, it's still like non-evaluative, right? Because like they aren't working at the firm currently. Uh, so, you know, I'd say like that's like the second level of your preparation uh, and then helps you like get a little more polish for the next level, which is actually reaching out to your connections at these different firms and asking them if they can case you. Uh, the reason why I leave that for the end is that a lot of people make the mistake of doing that too early. And, you know, even if someone tells you that that's not going to be evaluative, it kind of is, right? Because if you think about the type of work that a BCG does, we're like a very data-driven analytics heavy firm, right? So any opportunity you give us to get a better sense of whether you would be a fit at BCG, we will take it, right? So uh, most of the times, if you are going to run a practice case with someone from one of these consulting firms, it will be slightly evaluative, which is why you only want to do it when you think you are good enough to not completely bomb the case. Now, you don't need to be perfect, right? Because like, if someone asks me to do a practice case with them, I'm not looking for them to be perfect at the case right now. I'm more so looking for potential, right? Because I understand that they're still in the process of preparing and the interview is still like a week or a couple of weeks away. Uh, so th that's the thing that I'm going to be looking for. And the reason why it's helpful for you to do a practice case with someone like me is because I can give you like the most targeted feedback based on, you know, like how our case is run and based on what our consultant skills look like and what we're looking for. So I'd say that, you know, your preparation should include a combination of those three different types of case practice. Uh, but another mistake that a lot of people make is like having like a magic number, right? They need to do 50 cases and like that's, you know, going to get me the job or I need to do five cases and that should be enough. Like there's no magic number. It varies person to person. Uh, you know, some people might need to do 20 cases to feel more comfortable. Uh, some might only need to do five. Uh, some might need to do more, right? And I think like it's more so you need to chase the feeling of being comfortable with a case uh, to the point where like, if I was to randomly throw a case at you, like you'd be able to get your bearings and like try to solve it in a pretty efficient way. That's the feeling that you should be chasing versus like a specific magic number of like cases that you should do. Right, thank you so much. That was like super helpful. Uh, also wanted to ask you, uh, you know, why you chose your, you know, you're in a new role now at Mirror, you're working in strategy and ops. So what were the reasons for why uh, you left PCG uh, after working there for like well over two years. And what are the pros and cons of a career in management consulting? Yeah, so I think uh, for 90% of people who join consulting, especially, you know, the big three, so we can see being in BCG, uh, it's a short-term career. Uh, like most people going in, uh, you know, actually go with the intention of doing this for a few years and then leaving. And that's, kind of what they encourage as well, right? Because if you think about what makes a place like McKinsey or BCG so successful, it's their alumni network. Uh, oftentimes their alums will go on to lead massive companies and then hire BCG and McKinsey again to do the consulting work, right? So it's very well in their interest to help us find good jobs too. So I still remember, I think it was day one of my training where we had, you know, like your typical Excel PowerPoint training. And then we had a one hour session on what at BCG we call career transition, which is, you know, this really cool benefit that you have of, you know, let's say you've decided you don't want to stay at BCG anymore and you need more dedicated time to find a job, you can, uh, you know, like declare transition or like tell HR that you're going on transition. And what that means is that at the associate and the consultant level, so the undergrad and post MBA level, 
you get two months of full pay plus like the support of our career services team to find a job. Uh, you can also do four months of half pay uh, and again, use the career services team to find a job, uh, which is a pretty sweet benefit, right? Because like it's like BCG basically paying you to find a job and then also helping you find it. Uh, when you're a project leader, I think it turns into like three months of full pay or six months of half pay. And then as a principal, it's like four months of full pay, eight months of half pay. Point being, like, it's very well, you know, like a thing that happens all the time and places like BCG actually encourage you to seek other opportunities. Like one of my mentors at BCG actually, uh, when I wasn't even thinking about recruiting for other jobs, told me that they are always open to interviewing uh, for two reasons. One just to get a sense of like what types of opportunities are out there, right? Because like when you're working at a place like BCG, you get like so many intros and so many connects to like all these cool opportunities that it's always good to have like a sense of what's out there. And then the second is, uh, even if you decide not to take that job, I think it's way better to uh, want to work at BCG uh, and realize that by actually going externally and seeing what's out there versus staying at BCG and letting momentum just keep you there, right? So actively recruiting is something that I encourage uh, people should do like at, in whatever job they're at, especially because you know, if, if, you, if you think about organizations at the end of the day, uh, we're numbers to them, right? And like, it doesn't take organizations very long to lay off people that might've been working for 20 years if that's what suits the business, right? So at the end of the day, you need to be your best advocate and you need to make sure that you're actually looking out in the marketplace and doing the best for you. But point being at BCG, it's very encouraged to pursue these opportunities. And I knew going in that this was going to be a two, three year job for me at most. Uh, like I wanted to stay up until the point where uh, I was learning a lot. And the moment I felt my learning was stagnating a little, uh, slash, you know, like when I felt that, you know, I, I got the right opportunity, then I would leave for it. So that's kind of like my personal situation. And I think with places like BCG and McKinsey, the best time to leave is typically right before you make manager or then a year or so of being a manager, because that's typically when, uh, you know, the different opportunities that you can pursue are at their broadest. Uh, I think the more you stay at BCG, especially once you hit like the principal mark, which, you know, a senior manager effectively, uh, you start specializing in certain topic areas, which then means that the different opportunities you can pursue externally, like the, the band starts narrowing. And then if you also think about the skill set that you're building, uh, as an associate and then as a consultant, you're doing analysis that's going to be useful for whatever job you're going to end up doing, right? And then as a manager, you're learning to manage teams, which again, is like useful if you want to work in a manager capacity. But then beyond that, the skills you're building are more specific to consulting and more specific to BCG, which is why if you are interested in leaving, uh, you know, there's like diminishing returns to the skills that you're building and the learnings that you're getting. Uh, from like an external standpoint, like this is all super useful for staying at BCG and building a career here, but not necessarily as useful if like you're looking to recruit outside. Uh, so very long winded way of, you know, like giving you a sense of why I chose to leave. Uh, you know, it was something I thought about before I even joined BCG. It's something I thought about like, you know, constantly at BCG and that's just the culture over there. Like people are always thinking about what's out there. Uh, and then, you know, like this past fall, I decided after getting promoted to the post MBA role, uh, that, you know, I, I had hit the point where I was really good at my job and like, I was, you know, I, I was still learning a little bit based on whatever projects I was pursuing, but like it had fairly stagnated compared to like the steep learning curve that I had in my first couple of years. And uh, this is a really hot job market right now. So I was getting things like from all sorts of really cool opportunities. And I think for me, the biggest thing that was missing from my consulting experience was actual operational experience, right? Like consultants at the end of the day are advisors and we're going to work with Fortune 500 companies on what typically tend to be like more cost transformation or cost cutting cases, right? Because if you think about like a large mature organization, they're typically very like grown already and like they might be chasing growth, but like growth is a lot more difficult. So typically the lever that they use to maintain profitability is cutting down on costs. So it's a specific type of work. And like as a consultant, you're basically just advising them, right? You're not actually actioning any of those initiatives that you're doing the analysis on. You tell them what to do and then they're gonna go and do it. Um, so I wanted to change that. I wanted to be in a position where if I do an analysis on something and I think it's the right move, I actually want to be in the driver's seat and then go and implement it. Uh, the second thing I wanted to do was work more on that growth type of work. Uh, and, you know, like that typically is easier to do with startups because in startups, you're actually, you know, demonstrating product market fit and then like trying to scale and grow. Uh, 
And that's the type of experience that I didn't get at BCG, which is why I ultimately ended up recruiting for the job that I currently have. Which right, is- definitely. And uh, with these consultancies, like uh, exit options are prioritized. So like, you know, uh, fellow consultants will help you uh, to find opportunities elsewhere. And there's a good culture in that sense. So yep. maybe you have to ask, what about, are, are these opportunities open to people with a non-business background? So can you go in from like fields which are very diverse, like engineering, um, healthcare, like uh, even medicine, like, so are there opportunities for such people? Absolutely. And I would say that they're increasing day by day uh, because the general philosophy at McKinsey and BCG is that, you know, they want, it's, it's kind of like, if you think about U.S. college admissions, right? Like they, they want a diverse class because ultimately like that brings diversity of thought, that brings different skill sets, and that allows you to make more, uh, you know, like successful and well-rounded teams. So, uh, you know, if you're in college, your major doesn't matter. Uh, like I majored in economics because I thought that, you know, that was going to be like the, the business major at my school uh, and, you know, ultimately didn't enjoy the major as much as, you know, I might have enjoyed history or I might have enjoyed chemistry or something else that I was truly really passionate about. And my major had no role to play in the job that I got. Like I remember from U Chicago, like I think the four people that joined BCG, I was econ, we had a philosophy major, a math major, and then a CS major. So like your major doesn't matter major in whatever it is that you want to study in college. If you're in grad school, uh, it's really cool because all these consulting firms are now going to different grad schools to recruit that aren't business schools. Uh, so I know that like at U Chicago Law or Harvard Law, uh, you know, BCG and McKinsey are pretty active at recruiting there. So law school is definitely like a place that you can go uh, to consulting from, uh, you know, like a bunch of the MPP programs, I think like BCG recruits from them as well. Uh, I work with a couple of partners who were actually MDs in a past life. So they went to med school, became doctors, and then decided that medicine, or at least the practice of medicine in that respect, wasn't like what they wanted to do. So they switched to consulting and like now lead our healthcare practices. So there's like a lot of opportunity for you to move into consulting irrespective of whatever your major in college was or whatever your specialized degree is. Uh, I think that depending on what school you're going at uh, can, can make like a little bit of a difference in terms of like getting that first look. Uh, right, because if you go to like Harvard or U Chicago or Stanford or MIT, right, these very reputable schools where BCG and McKinsey will already have established institutional connections, right, it's much easier to transition from like MIT engineering uh, to like BCG, right, because BCG is going to be recruiting at MIT for the college and the business school anyway, right. Uh, but that being said, even if you're not at one of these schools, it's like still very doable. The way that I would do it is, you know, try to see if there's any alums from your program working at these schools, because then you can reach out to them and they had to make a similar jump to you, right? So they kind of get where you're coming from and what your challenges are. And they're likely to be better partners and sponsors for you than, you know, like someone that you maybe like reach out to that you don't have that connection with. Uh, and if you don't have any connections like that, then, you know, maybe even like look at alums from your undergrad, right? Uh, like any uh, things that you can find in common when you're networking with someone is typically what allows those connections to be a lot more effective. Uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, these consultants are gonna be really busy. Like I, I think about like the amount of outreach that I used to get, I would get at least five emails every week from like people from New Chicago. I would get like north of 20 LinkedIn requests every week. Uh, and it's just a lot, right? So like. Uh, I, I want to help, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I have limited time, uh, especially, you know, given my hours in consulting, right? So what I'm going to be doing from all those requests is prioritizing the ones where they're either from, you know, the same school as me, or they mention something that they have in common with me, or someone connected them with me, right? So like, that's typically the best way to get the connection, right? If like someone can vouch for another person and email me and say, hey, you should talk to Emma, right? Like I, I work with Emma, the XYZ thing, and I think he's going to be a really good fit. Uh, that that's how I'm going to prioritize. And ultimately, like, that's how you should be thinking about reaching out to people. Great. Thank you, Tala. Uh, now that you've actually uh, you know, left BCG for this new opportunity, I think you're best placed to answer this question. Um, how do you compare the top four consulting firms, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, Deloitte? What is the work culture like? I'm sure you have colleagues in the management consulting space, so you can shed some light on this. Yep, absolutely. So I would say that... Uh, you know, if you think about the different consulting firms, historically, McKinsey, Bain, and BCG were specialists in strategy. Uh, so, you know, they did strategy consulting, which is a very specific subset of, you know, the overall management consulting term. Uh, and what that means is typically working with the CEO or CFO or the board of the company brings you in for like very 
uh, important priorities for the CEO. So like, if you think about like a typical CEO job, right? Like they have like three to five major initiatives that they're working on. And for those initiatives, you know, like some of those they might want to figure out themselves for others, like they might want to bring in experts in the space, which, you know, tends to be the like DCG game. Uh, so historically, these three firms worked on those types of cases. But as I mentioned, you know, over the past 10 to 15 years, clients have become a lot more sophisticated and their demands have gone up, right? And uh, BCG charges very heavy premiums, right? And if the work that we're doing is only going to catch dust at a client's office, then it's not valuable, right? So they started asking us for more implementable work. All right, so like that even changed the way that we thought about strategy, right? Because it's no longer about the right answer. It's about the answer that's right for this particular client, right? Like the answer for like, which market should you enter could be China, right? Because of like all the underlying economic uh, indicators that make it a very profitable or attractive market to enter. But then you factor in like regulation and also maybe like the company's ownership structure and the like, right? And you're facing like an uphill battle. So the answer for this particular client might not be China. It might instead be the UK, right? So uh, these companies had to start changing the way that they thought about strategy work. And then they also had to start building a lot of like their implementation arms such that, you know, they can actually convince the client to just stay with BCG to do all of this work. That's where the Deloitte's and the Accenture's come in because historically they were focused almost exclusively on the more operations or the implementation side of consulting, right? So uh, historically what would happen is like a BCG would do a project for two months for a CEO and then the CEO would pump the work to like, you know, the CEO's reports. So like, you know, like two or three layers below the CEO and they would have a budget and then they would contract a Deloitte or an Accenture to like help operationalize that uh, recommendation that BCG gave, right? They started moving more into the strategy space and then McKinsey, BCG, Bain started moving more downstream. Uh, so now you have like all these players doing like a little bit of everything, uh, which like on the one hand is good because it means that regardless of what firm you join, you can get a little bit of like, you know, experience in operations. You can get like experience in strategy. You can do like a little bit of both depending on what firm you're joining, which I think is good. But what that means is that it's made it very confusing to think about how to differentiate between the firms, right? Uh, so the way I would think about it, uh, you know, based on my personal experience, and then also like all my friends who work at all these different consulting firms, uh, McKinsey, Bain, BCG are the three firms that everyone should be targeting. Uh, because having worked at Deloitte for a little bit before BCG, I will say that the quality of work at a BCG is much higher. The quality of people at BCG is significantly higher. Uh, and then the quality of your clients is significantly higher and they tend to be more senior, right? Like almost every single one of my projects at BCG was sponsored by a C-suite executive. Whereas if I think about like, uh, you know, my four projects I did at Deloitte, uh, none of them were, you know, like C-suite. They tended to be like the level below the C-suite or the level below that level, right? So like L2, L3. Uh, and I think that makes a difference, right? Like you can still build all of those skills. You can still like learn a lot. But uh, I think if you're working with more talented people, uh, if you're working with more senior clients, and if you're working on more interesting problems, right? Like ultimately that's the better way to experience this job, especially because you're going to be working pretty late hours. Right? And it's going to take up such a significant chunk of your life that I argue you should absolutely try for the best three places, right? Now, you also need to be realistic. Uh, you know, I, I like if I think about U Chicago recruiting, which was a target school, uh, I recall, I think my year, maybe 250 or 300 people applied for the job. And then I think 20 got first on interviews. So like it's a pretty steep cutoff, right? Like only 10% of applicants got an interview. From those 20, I think we went to like 10 in the final round. And then from 10 in the final round, I think there were two offers, right? So like two out of 250 is pretty difficult. Uh, and especially if you think about, you know, like Hsonians, uh, a lot of us tend to be non-Americans, right? Which means that visa sponsorship is a pretty big issue. So I think you need to cast a wider net. It's important to be aspirational and shoot for the best firms, but it's also important to be realistic and, you know, make sure that you have a backup, which is, I think, where the Deloitte's, the Accenture's, the EY's, KPMG, and the like come into place. And, you know, when I say they're backups, like, they're still like excellent firms, right? I think that anyone should be happy to work at those places if like that's what you want to do with consulting but uh you know that that's kind of how i would think about the different firms and then you have like a bunch of specialists as well right so lek specializes in 
more diligence work and frankly is way better than like a Deloitte or an Accenture at that, right? Because Deloitte might maybe do 1% of their total portfolio in diligence whereas LEK does like 90% of it, right? So like if going into private equity is a goal of yours and like an LEK is much better. Uh, similarly, if technology is really important to you, then all of a sudden Accenture becomes a lot more relevant, right? Because Accenture is fundamentally not even a consulting organization anymore. It's an IT services provider of sorts. Uh, so I think depending on what your hypothesis is for what you want to do after consulting can also shape what consulting firm you pick. But in most cases, when people ask me, like I always tell them to, you know, target McKinsey, and BCG, and those three are more similar than different. Uh, and then, you know, like take it from there. Great advice, Tala. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for answering all of my questions. Uh, I would like everyone to please give Tala a virtual applause, uh, because I think this has been like extremely useful. And now we'll go on to our Q&A session with the audience. So if the audience has any questions for Tala, they can raise their hands by going to reactions and using the raise hand feature. Great, so we have our first question from Farhan Sadiq. Uh, Farhan, please go ahead. Hey Tala, thanks for doing this. Uh, my question is uh, around what you touched on a bit earlier about being international students and having to factor that into your decision-making. When you were thinking about advancing your career, moving on from BCG or even coming to BCG, how big of a role did that play? And I know bigger firms are more open to uh, sponsoring students. So did you think about the H-1B or did you think about the green card and beyond that while you were uh, you know, framing your career, advancing your career in that aspect? Yeah, absolutely. I would say like that was probably the number one factor for me, right? Because like at the end of the day, if uh, a firm is not going to sponsor my visa, like I can't stay in the US, right? So like that, that's like a deal breaker for me. Uh, and I think the nice thing for recruiting from college is that uh, your school can help you figure out which firms are open to sponsoring uh, because they actually talk to the firms about that. And I remember I think when I was at UChicago, the only four consulting firms that did sponsor and were recruiting from UChicago were McKinsey, Bain, BCG, and Deloitte, right? So that meant that I did not apply to Accenture. I did not apply to LEK. I did not apply to any of those other consulting firms because uh, they weren't going to sponsor me, right? Which is why, like, it's just a waste of time for, like, me to go through the process and, you know, frankly, a waste of time for them also to interview me if they're not going to be able to sponsor my visa after. So it's a very important factor and like ultimately I think is like what makes it so difficult to break into consulting, uh, you know, as a foreign national, especially if you are recruiting from undergrad, uh, because I think from grad school, it's slightly different. Accenture does take foreign nationals from business school, from what I last recall, I think LEK does the same. And the reason for that, you know, is, I don't know how familiar you are with the H1B lottery process, right? But like, typically grad degrees get like two bats at the lottery, whereas like undergrad degrees only get the one, right? And there's more undergrads left spots. So like uh, th that's why a lot of these firms that typically are willing to sponsor grad students are not willing to sponsor undergrad, right? So like, just make sure you're actually targeting the places that do sponsor visas to be mindful of your time and their time. Uh, in terms of like, once you get the offer, hopefully, right? Like, how do you think about like the H1B? How do you think about the green card? The nice thing about these firms is that uh, they're such global firms that even if you don't get the H-1B, they're happy to relocate you, assuming you're doing well and you know, you're in good standing at the firm uh, to like a different office, right? So one of my friends as an example, did not get the H-1B and did not have the STEM extension. So after like a year, I had to leave the US. Uh, BCG just moved into Toronto. Uh, and then, you know, like he was still able to work actually with a lot of people in Chicago because Toronto and Chicago offices like work pretty close together. Uh, he was just living in Toronto for like a year. And then I think they reapplied for like his H-1B that didn't work out. And then they actually applied for his L-1 which is like an intercompany transfer visa. Uh, and then he got that and now he's back in the US. So the benefit with being with a larger firm is that they have so much experience doing this stuff and they have like an entire legal team and immigration team that is like, this is their bread and butter and they have dedicated resources towards this. So there's no better place to be from that standpoint uh, if you're a foreign national. The green card policy varies firm to firm. So at BCG, I think you need to stay for at least four years before they sponsor you for the green card, which for me is like, was it was a little too much, right? So like I thought about that because like I think I was about to hit three years this summer and then four years would have been like, you know, summer of next year. And then they would have been willing to sponsor my green card, but you know, getting the green card is like another separate like two year minimum process, right? And typically takes a lot longer than that. So that means like six, seven years at BCG at which point like I'm probably gonna make partner, but like that's not what I wanna do. So uh, that that's a very personal decision, right? Like you need to think about 
uh, what's important for you. If like your biggest priority is getting the green card and seeing what the BCG does make sense because like, they have a very institutionalized way of doing that, but they're not the only place that does it. Uh, one of the companies that I was recruiting for when I was you know, thinking of leaving BCG was Google and Google's policy, I think is responsible to green cards on day one. So if like the green card is what was most important for me, uh, the most optimal decision for me would actually have been to leave BCG and go to Google because they would have sponsored it day one. Whereas my current employer is not going to sponsor it right now, but uh, that's also because like I'm considering going to business school in a year and a half, right? So like I don't want to apply for the green card right now because then that would shift my timeline with that, right? So very personal decision, but point being, target the firms that are willing to sponsor your visa, try for the H-1B, of course, and then if the H-1B doesn't work out, just make sure that you're doing good work at these firms because they're very happy to relocate you to figure something else out. Thank you, Ji. Uh, our next question is from uh, Sir Nakia Bas. Uh, Tala, first of all, very nice and very informative session. Thank you very much for that. Um, wanted to ask, obviously, after graduating from a local university, not everybody will be lucky to get a get that chance to work with one of these companies. What would you advise the local students, let's say, what they should, what companies could they possibly join locally in Pakistan in order for them to be considered for BCG and uh, uh, McKinney and all these companies? Yep, that's a great question. So I would think about it uh, from two angles. The first is I think now McKinsey and maybe like even BCG, but BCG Dubai or BCG Riyadh have started recruiting at some Pakistani universities. I think like Lums in particular uh, has developed a pipeline, uh, which is helpful, right? Because like the more people from Lums that are gonna go to these firms, like the more they're gonna recruit in the future, right? So it's like a cycle that continues and hopefully will keep getting better. Uh, so if you're at one of those schools where a McKinsey or a BCG, even, you know, like the non-Pakistani offices are coming and recruiting, like that's, you know, like your best way to like get a shot at moving directly into these firms. And then, you know, you can work there for a couple of years. And then after that, like you can also request office transfers if let's say the goal for you is to move to North America, right? Like that, that's something that I've seen happen before uh, and something you can absolutely do. Now, of course, like that's the more optimistic scenario, right? Because again, they have a limited number of sets. And I think McKinsey is the only big consulting firm with like a Pakistani office. So, and it's not gonna be one of the bigger offices, right? So there's gonna be very few spots. So I think the more uh, like unconventional track that you can take to eventually move into a consulting firm is by either working with some other local consulting firms. Like I think there's a bunch now in Pakistan, especially in the Lahore area, uh, because of like all the public sector work happening over there that you can you know potentially work at. The benefit to working at a local consulting firm is that you could then you know later on apply to a McKinsey Bay and BCG outside of Pakistan even and talk about the different consulting experiences you've had and the skills you've built, right? So that makes you a more compelling candidate because you actually have experience in the space. Uh, and then I think the second benefit to that is that, you know, like you can also figure out if consulting is what you wanna do, right? Because like, let's say uh, you do this for two years at a local consulting firm and you decide that, you know, the advisory role isn't what you're meant for, then great, you can, you know, try to target something else. So that's like one track. Now, if like, the goal is twofold that you want to move into consulting and you also maybe want to you know like be in consulting outside of pakistan a very tried and tested but you know somewhat expensive way of doing it is to come abroad for a grad degree right uh like so i know a lot of people from lums who will come to the us to places like chicago for like a one year or two year masters right uh and the benefit of that is that it opens up your access to the american market and then it also buys you time uh, right, because then you're not recruiting for a job while you're still an undergrad, you're actually recruiting for the job once you're at grad school. Uh, I think the, the mistake that I've seen some people make with that, though, is waiting too long to do it, uh, because the way that typically recruiting works uh, in the US, especially for something like consulting, it starts as soon as school starts, right? So like if your degree uh, matriculation is like in August of, let's say, 2022, right? McKinsey, Bay CG, and Bain are going to show up in August of 2022. Uh, and that really doesn't give you a lot of time to prepare. So you need to make sure that you're doing all the prep before you actually go, such that once you're you know, in this program, you can hit the ground running and like talk to the people that you need to talk to and your case prep enough such that if you were to appear for interviews in a few weeks, uh, you, you are able to you know, like do a good job. So I'd say those are like the, the three tracks that I see for local students uh, to go into consulting. But I will say that, you know, even doing something like a corporate rotation program at like a Unilever or like another like big Fortune 500 at Pakistan is still very valuable 
uh, both from a, you can move from that to consulting directly as long as you know you can get the right resources to get connected with and like network your way to getting an interview. Uh, but then increasingly, so I'm seeing a lot of these students go to business school in the US, and then that is typically the easiest way to get a consulting job because consulting firms love business, uh, like MBA students, like that's typically their biggest pipeline, that's typically like where they recruit the bulk of their candidates from, and you know, like you get two years to network and like find that job, so uh, like, you know, that, that's another track that you could look at. Great, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, G Farhan, you have a second question. Please go ahead. Yeah, if you, there's no more question, I'll ask a follow up. Oh, okay, so must have been from before. Okay. No, no, I said if nobody else has a question, I can go ahead and ask one. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So, Tala, a couple of related questions. One is given that consulting of CS long hours, you're burning the midnight oil now and then. How did you keep up with recruiting or like keeping your networks or, you know, just, just touching base with people now and then? It seems like a tough job to do while while working as well. And on top of that, earlier you mentioned that these you're just a number to these firms. I would imagine bigger firms like BCG Bain would be one of those firms where you could rely on security. If you're doing well, there wouldn't be you no know, layoffs or air, things like that. So there's more of a chance of sticking for longer. So my question is one, did you think differently about that? And two, how did you keep your networks going on while you were there working long hours? Yep, yep. So that's one of the reasons why a BCG offers that transition program I was talking about, right? Because it's just so difficult to recruit for jobs and appear for interviews when like you have clients who are emailing you every five minutes and like you have deadlines to meet like every day and you're working until midnight, right? So it, it's very difficult. And having done, having not taken the transition program and having recruited for a job while I was working full time at BCG, like it required just a lot of work for me on the weekends. Uh, so it's not something I would recommend to everyone, but you know, for me, I was weighing it with the, you know, visa consideration, right? So like I'm on an H-1B, right? And what that means is like, if I start the transition program, that basically gives me two months to find a job or four months if I go down that route, after which like, let's say if I still haven't found a job, I have 60 days uh, until my H-1B expires, right? So for me, the more risk averse move, even if that required more work from me was to recruit for a job while uh, working, which again, was a pretty painful process. Uh, so the way that I worked my way through it was by being very, very targeted in my search. So I decided that there was really one type of role that I was gonna recruit for. I wanted to be in the health, wellness and fitness space because that's the space I'm most passionate about. And I wanted to work at a startup. Uh, so that's why, you know, initially I was talking to Google, I was talking to LinkedIn, and then I decided that while those are excellent companies and maybe those would be companies that we wanna join in the future, it's just not what I wanna do right now. So like I started saying no to all those opportunities and I was exclusively recruiting at places like Peloton or at mental health startups or at Mirror. Uh, and, you know, like that's how I eventually got my job. So being very targeted in your search, I think is like one helpful thing that you can do. Uh, to answer the second part of your question, so yeah, like you are still a number, uh, you know, at BCG. Uh, like if I think about like the Chicago office alone, right? We have 700 employees. Uh, if I think about the like BCG North America, there's probably like, you know, close to 3,000, 4,000 employees minimum, right? So, and these are just like consulting employees. So what that means is like you are one of like a thousand others. And then the thing you need to think about is that typically as an individual, you have no leverage with these firms, right? Because a BCG is the type of place where like, even if you decide to leave, there's thousands of people waiting in the line behind you to be willing to take that job. So they really don't care that much about you wanting to leave or asking you to leave if you're not doing well, because they have such a strong recruiting pipeline and they know that they're going to fill that job very quickly. And that's the model. Like I said, 90% of people leave within two to three years. If I think about my start class, over 50% has already left and I expect a lot more are gonna be leaving this summer. So the entire model is actually built on people leaving uh, at the junior levels and then you know, the senior levels retention is like a little bit of a more important thing. Uh, but so that's one consideration. That being said though, if you're doing well, uh, there is no more risk averse way to build a very successful career uh, where you're making a lot of money, you're learning a lot, you're like recruiting or sorry, you're like opportunities outside of BCG will also be very healthy, but like even within BCG, like you just get to do a lot. So if you decide that consulting is something you're willing to do for the long term, and if you're doing well, like it is one of the most secure jobs you can get because unlike, you know, more traditional corporations, 
the benefit with the McKinsey and BCG is that they're actually resistant to a lot of like economic cycles. So even during recession time, right? Like, yes, their clients' budgets might shrink in a little, but you know, as we saw in 2020, when the COVID crisis hit, they immediately pivoted into COVID work and now they become specialists on COVID public policy and like COVID response for like public organizations. So uh, like I saw BCG and McKinsey avoid any layoffs even you know, during the start of the pandemic, uh, which I think they just get to do because they're very healthy businesses and they're very quick to pivot when they need to. Uh, so it is a very secure job from that standpoint, but it, it's like this double-edged sword of it's secure if you are doing well and to do well requires like a lot of work and it's a very high bar. Uh, so you could make an argument about it not being actually that secure, right? It, it's just like, it's, it's not like other firms though where you can just randomly get laid off. Like that doesn't happen at BCG. The way it typically works is you will get a warning three months before if like you're not doing well because we get reviewed every six months. It's like a pretty uh, rigorous review process where every single project you get a score uh, you're reviewed by the committee for your office every six months. You're compared to like the rest of your class. Like they even have like a matrix that they like plot you on. And if you're like within a certain quadrant of the matrix, you get a warning. Then you have three months to turn it around. If you don't turn it around in three months, then they ask you to leave and you know you start the transition process. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, we have time for one last question. So if anyone would like to uh, raise a hand, now is the time. Okay, give it uh, three more seconds. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Talha, for taking out time. I know it was very early for you and myself, 9 a.m. on a Sunday. And, you know, I really, really appreciate that you took out time for this. Thank you so much to the audience for your great questions. Uh, this session has been recorded and will be uploaded on YouTube uh, for the whole public to watch, not just Atesonians. So thanks again. Take care. Allah Hafiz. Thank you for organizing. Allah Hafiz. Thank you, Emma. Thank you.